Dune, welcome back to the Visionary Life Podcast. You were first on the show uh, last season, and we kind of covered your whole journey, shifting from a more corporate role into the founder of Female Startup Club. And the reason why you're back on the podcast is because you have actually just launched a brand new book. And if you're watching this on YouTube, which uh, most people don't, but regardless, I'm holding up a copy of your book right now. It is beautiful. <laughs> the sweater that you are wearing to record this podcast actually matches the book. It and does, it is it honestly such a fun book to just pick up, open to a random page. And I love numerology. So I'll be like, okay, my mom's birthday is April 11th. So I'm going to go to page 11. And then I just let my finger go down and I read a couple sentences And I ask myself, how can I apply this to my business? And it is that kind of book. So I can't wait to dive into this with you. Welcome back to the show. Oh my gosh, what an introduction. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. I'm so excited to chat today. And I'm obviously so thrilled about the book launch. It has been such a long time in the making and I can't believe it's out in the world and that people like you are holding it and talking about it and loving it. It's really cool to see. Thank you so much. All the way in Canada, people are holding all the way in Canada. Um, So cool. People who didn't tune in to our first episode, can you give us like the quick one or two minute rundown of why you decided to start the female startup club? Yes, let me tell you the tweet-sized version of the story of Female Startup Club. At the time, a few years ago, I was basically building a D2C brand. I was kind of like not, you know, sure where I wanted it to go. Like I wasn't really sure of the pathway, of the blueprint. And I was chatting to my girlfriends about like what they were doing in their businesses, how they were doing something, why they were doing something, what advice they would give me. And it was really cool information. And I just had this thought of like, maybe I should be sharing these conversations. And at that same time, I remember reading a copy of Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss, which I was so inspired by. And I love the book. It features lots of billionaire, high performer, athlete kind of folks. But I really found myself thinking like, wow, I'd love to hear the same direct, no bullshit energy, but from women who are in the same league. And it kind of clicked you know, together that I was like, well, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do something about it. And I happened to have femalestartupclub.com as a URL that I'd bought years before in, you know, a spree of buying like all these different (laughs) startupclub.com URLs and basically just started publishing. And it was really like humble beginnings, no kind of big grand plans and, well, that's longer than a tweet size version now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you've gone <laughs> way beyond 100 characters. I've, I've gone <laughs> beyond 100 characters. But basically, in short, you know, I started it from the bedroom floor, just recording this podcast, publishing it, putting it out. It became a bit sticky. And today we like to think of Female Startup Club as a media company that's helping women build meaningful e-commerce businesses. And we do that through inspiring content like our top podcast, top 10 podcast for entrepreneurship and things like this book that we've just released. And then through tactical resources, like our private network and digital resources. Mm. It's so interesting because I think a lot of people would tune into this episode here. You launched a book and assume that you did have this grand calculated plan from the beginning, but you're basically saying I didn't have a plan. Like I just enjoyed (laughs) the idea of the female startup club, bought the domains many years later, decided to kind of dive in with the podcast. So when did you actually sit down and start dreaming about what was possible for the business? Like, did you have like this whole Excel spreadsheet strategy? Did you do a vision board or is it still just all marinating in your head? Like, when did you actually start to build this idea out? Oh my God, not a spreadsheet. (laughs) That's that's not my go-to. I would say things mostly live in my head and I just have like these little ideas and these little gems like tucked away in different pockets. But for the books in particular, I always kind of had that in the back of my mind. Like I looked at Tim Ferriss and I thought, wow, he has this really amazing podcast. He's managed to turn it into all sorts of different things, including a book. Maybe I could do something like that too. But that was like just planted in the background. There was no plan kind of thing for that in the beginning so I was just there you know recording the podcast doing my thing 
And then at the start of every year, I love to set a really big goal for myself. I love to set one goal that's very tactical, very clear, and has a list of steps to get there. It's like a clear pathway. I also love to set all the other kind of goals, by the way, like be healthy and like drink more water. And I often don't do them, but the tactical goal I love to do. So in 2020, my tactical goal was to publish 100 episodes of the podcast and just see what happened. Like just see if it was something by the time, you know, I got to a hundred, because I think like when you specifically are building a podcast and you would know this, Kelsey, it's like, you can't think about the numbers day to day because podcasting is such a long-term game and it's soul destroying to look at your numbers when you're just starting out and being like, no one's listening. Like, should I keep going? Like, do people even like this? Like how are people going to find me? But when you get to that, you know, end of the first year, end of the second year, and you look back at all of your compounded kind of efforts, you're like, oh, holy shit, like this has actually become something really cool. So I set the goal of 100 and that was simply because I thought 100 was a cool number to achieve in year one. From where I was at that point, I think it was like April or May, I worked out how many I needed to publish per week to get there. It was three per week and I would finish on the 29th of December. Boom, goal for that year. Hit it, achieved it, loved it, was like, okay, there's something here with Female Startup Club, I'm going to keep going. And then last year in January, I was like, what's my big goal going to be? Like, what do I want to do? And I was either looking back at my notes from the year prior or like just thinking back about it and like scribbling. I remember scribbling in a notebook and I was like, well, maybe this year could be the year that I bring out my first book because I envisioned it as a series. I envisioned Female Startup Club having a series of these kind of books that can you know sit on someone's shelf and be there for whenever they just need that book moment in their life I love the book moment I love picking up physical products and you know holding something tangible and so yeah basically I just thought okay well maybe this is going to be the year and that was probably like I think it was like on the 4th of January when I set the goal and then on the 7th of January I think that was the Monday might have the dates wrong but you know what I'm saying and got to work And basically that was, that was it. I just started working on it. And then here we are 14 months later. So epic. Okay. So the one thing I really want to double tap on, because I think this is really relevant to our listeners, (laughs) love to double tap because when you say I just got to work and I started working on it, I think there's a lot of people going, what does it look like to start working on a book? Like, do you need to hire a publishing company? Did you employ somebody full-time to write it? Did you just open a Google doc and literally start jotting down ideas? Like, Mm -hmm. how do we take the idea of, I want to write a book. I want to launch it in 14 months, but actually start doing things. What did you do? Totally. So I can tell you everything that I did. First of all, let's be clear. This isn't a memoir. It's not like I've invented some amazing story that is like, you know, a huge project. That's not what this is. Female Startup Club. I already had my podcast episodes that were transcribed and I could take those stories. They were already there and turn them into something else. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different kind of book to like a beautiful story or a beautiful novel or whatever that you've picked up off the shelf. This is absolutely, you know, also to be clear, a part of a marketing initiative for Female Startup Club. This further, you know, connects with people who are my target audience. This is further to build brand awareness for Female Startup Club out in the world and just something that I wanted to do too for myself. So early steps were first deciding, well, first actually the early steps were talking to people who had books. I was like asking my friends like, hey, you've got a published book. Like, what did you do? How did you do it? What did you think? In hindsight, would you do that again? Is it the same path that you would take? And I did that on the flip side for people who had self-published. And what I found was people who had worked with publishers, because you need to make this distinction, right? I mean, you don't need to do it at the very beginning, but you need to decide like what the goal is and what the purpose of the book is Mm. and whether you need to go which direction kind of thing. So People who had worked with publishers, the kind of feedback that I got was, you know, it's great if you want to be stocked on shelves in traditional bookstores and kind of have that exposure because, yes, you will be stocked everywhere. If you're in the UK, the major store here is Waterstones. If you're in Australia, I think it's called Dimmix. I'm sure that's exactly the same in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of like a key part of that goal. But the trade-off is you don't own your IP or you don't own a lot of your IP um you know the royalties are low and you don't have creative freedom 
And so for me, it was actually like within a few conversations, it became really obvious that I was 100% going to go down the self-publishing route because I absolutely wanted to own my own P, IP. I absolutely want creative freedom in what goes inside the book, what the book looks like, all that kind of stuff. And for me, I don't care about being stocked on the shelves of the stores because I don't need to reach those people. This is absolutely like for my community and reaching people online, which, you know, that's what I do. I'm like reaching people online every day. So I feel like I have that skill set to do it anyway. I don't need the publisher's help for that. So I decided that's the way that I wanted to go, self-publishing, but there's something called professional self-publishing, which is not just like me as a non-professional writer putting something into a book and just like putting it out there. I worked with experts every step of the way to make sure that this was a professional book that someone could pick up and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's the right structure. You know, it's written properly, all that kind of thing. So I'm not a professional writer, (laughs) but we basically found, we went out and found someone who is an editor or a ghostwriter, whatever you like to call it, who could help me determine my ideas, my thoughts, my tone of voice, the things that I wanted to say, but kind of put it in a nice parcel and make it more professional because I had a lot of things about how I wanted to, you know, sound and I would write something, but it wouldn't be like perfect kind of thing. And I I had a lot of trouble actually with the introduction because it's so personal, your own introduction and, and your own story of what you want to say and how you want it to be received and all this kind of thing. So for me, that took actually the most time because it was so deeply personal and, you know, me writing something and then having someone else rewrite it and kind of get it together takes a lot of time but in back to like the beginning I hired this person and we basically just spent months going back and forth and choosing the people who we would want in the show and crafting one chapter at a time and we have 51 women in the book plus my introduction my story and the ending and I thought at the time that wasn't a lot. I really was pushing for 100. I thought that was a great idea. But in hindsight, 51 is a lot, a lot, a lot. So we would kind of like figure out all these things, like who we wanted in the book, this kind of thing, and then develop the structure, the tone, and then kind of like just get to work, like doing one by one chapter. But it took a really, really long time. And so that was kind of like the meat and bones of like what we did. And then after that, I hired a like a specific copywriter to, again, get a new fresh set of eyes to go back through the whole book. And keep in mind, the book's like 370 pages. It's not like a, a light book. It's still quite big. So hired a copywriter to go back through everything and, you know, the amount of changes that they had as well was crazy. Like in terms of grammar, punctuation, you have to make sure that your whole book, and this is why you should work with professionals at every step of the way, you know, you have to make sure your whole book is like styled. And what that means is like, you know, if you write e-commerce one way here, it needs to be written the same way, you know, 20 chapters down the track. And like, if you write the number one way up here, it needs to be written the same way over there. Mm -hmm. And that was just like also something I hadn't kind of like fully thought of that things needed to be like in sync like that. Um, And I didn't think there'd be so many issues with it, but there were so many so many changes that we needed to go through, um, which was really interesting. And, you know, just all these little funny things that I didn't necessarily know about. Um, What else? Then cover design, had to work with a cover designer. Then, hmm. Then there was, it moved more towards like outreach. Like, so talking a lot back and forth to who I wanted to be kind of like promoting the book, marketing, all that kind of thing. But I'm having a bit of a mind blank of the steps in between those two. Well, let's pause there. I let's think, pause. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, before we get into kind of the launching, which I know is its own beast, like you bring this baby to life and then you're like, oh my God, I still have to promote it and sell it, which is its whole other, you know, a whole other ball game. But in the launch process, you said you worked on it for about 14 months, right? And there was obviously a lot of hands involved, a lot of people required Uh, from your kind of weekly schedule, how much of your time and energy went into crafting and bringing this book to life over 14 months? Like, I don't know if you want to tell me like a number of hours per week or a percentage of your time, but it sounds like it was like a little bit more of a a labor intensive project than maybe you imagined. So I'd just be curious to know how much of your resources went towards the book. I... That's a great question. I didn't calculate 
like how much of my time I spent on it. But basically the way that it would work is that there would be lots of back and forth on email, that kind of thing consistently throughout the weeks. And then on Sunday, I would usually carve out a set number of hours, say like six to basically like get into a flow and like focus. Because what I find is during the week, I have calls, I have podcasts, I have like a million emails that I really struggle to do like longer tasks so I would always carve out that time on a Sunday and you know not every single Sunday I wasn't like strict with that but like Sundays is when I typically Sunday afternoon was like okay I need to get into the zone I need to do a lot with the book and just work my way through it because there was so much changes so much back and forth um Mm -hmm. and you know it's just so many chapters (laughs) that's a really good tip too to not assume that you can just like pop in, work on the book for an hour on a Monday and then a Wednesday and a Friday. I'm the same way. Like there's so much going on on a weekday between nine to five. You don't get that deep focused work done, but if you can find a dedicated day, maybe it's every Friday or like you did every Sunday where you say, okay, the world is kind of on pause right now, at least in business land and email land and social land. This is the time that I'm going to sink into the book because we all have heard that statistic that like, you know, multitasking and bouncing back and forth between tasks, you actually lose a lot of productivity doing that. But when you can actually sit into a project and really get into that flow state, it's super helpful. So I think that's a really good tip for the listener. 100% me. (laughs) The other interesting thing that I want to point out to anybody who aspires to write a book is what you mentioned at the beginning, which is that you were not writing a memoir. You're not acting as the expert necessarily in this book, but you're actually like the knowledge broker. So because you've recorded hundreds of podcasts, you are acting as that person who's then packaging it all up, all the best tips and tricks into like a nice, neat little box, tying a ribbon on it and saying, here, I made this for you, but I'm not like standing on the stage, sharing my own thought leadership necessarily. And I think that's a very undertapped market is simply like being the curator of knowledge and making it really simple for people to get the best tips in this case for e-com and D2C business owners. And they don't have to like scour the internet looking for all the best interviews. You've done the heavy lifting for them and put it into one $20 book, right? So it's like this cool opportunity that people don't think of. They're like, I have to go get my master's or I have to study more, or I need to come up with this revolutionary concept. What about just being the curator of knowledge? And um, that's actually the type of book that I, and it sounds like you love to read as well. It's like, give me the best billion dollar strategies. Give me the best marketing plans. And um, yeah, I think it's an opportunity that I just don't hear a lot of people taking advantage of. Absolutely. And I mean, that's my whole philosophy with the show as well. I've never wanted to position myself as the expert or the guru. I've always positioned myself as, Hey, I'm learning from these brilliant minds and I'm just like amplifying that to more people as well who are like me and want to learn. Um, But absolutely. I'm not the, the, the expert or the guru in any Mm -hmm. sense. Do you still, because you're not acting as the expert, I'd be curious to know, do you still experience any imposter syndrome or because you're just curating other people who have launched their brands, maybe you don't feel imposter syndrome. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I, like some days, yes, some days, no, like it's always different how I feel about all this kind of thing. Sometimes I'm like, who am I to be doing this? But then other days I'm like, well, damn straight. It's me to be doing this. Like it really changes. That's like such a reflection of my personality. I'm just like, so kind of indecisive on like a specific way. <laughs> I'm like that too. It's like the pendulum swings, right? One yes. day I'm Depends like, Depends on what yeah, my mood is. <laughs> I'm on fire. Things are going well. I deserve to have a voice. And other days I'm like, go crawl back into your little hole, Kelsey. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's me. normal. Okay. So now let's fast forward a little bit. I know there's probably so much more in the creation, but you shared some really juicy tips. So we'll leave that there. Then you're thinking about the launch. So I'm curious, how have you found the launch so far and what have been some of the most impactful strategies that you've used to get awareness or sales of the book? Mm-hmm. 
So the launch plan that we came up with was very much like what you would expect. Omni-channel, do a bit of everything, but, you know, I'm still kind of limited by like budget and things like that. So I'm trying to do things on a smaller scale. So I set myself a goal of having myself on 10 podcasts talking about the book. I set a list of, uh, I'm going to say 10, but like around 10 kind of thing. Yeah. Around 10 TikToker slash Instagrammers to create content, not specifically with the goal of like those, you know, going viral and crazy and driving lots of sales, but to just like create a nice buzz in addition to everything else that we have going on that we can then use that content. You know, I can do it that content on TikTok and I can repost it on our Instagram and, you know, have the hype there kind of thing from other amazing women that I really respect, but not as this like sales driver. And so that's a lot of what I was doing in general is just like trying to create this little simmering buzz, but without kind of thinking like, this is going to change everything. And it's going to be this one specific thing. So podcasts, the TikToks, I then reached out to, I would scroll through my um, emails and just reach out to anyone who had a newsletter and be like, hey, is there a way that we could do a promo or a swap? Or like, can I pay for placement? Like whatever it was. And I found a handful of people who were able to do that. I reached out obviously to the 51 women who were involved to send them a copy with gifting and asking them to post in the lead up to the launch and on launch day. Yeah. I sent gifts to friends as well. I think we probably sent out a hundred copies to be specific, um, which was actually a big, a big expense because shipping a book internationally was like 16 pounds, not including the cost of the book. So it was quite expensive. That was like something that I hadn't really considered. Mm -hmm. And what else, what else, what else? I actually have a list here. I'm going to pull it up. These are all, yeah, super. I love that you kind of have like goals attached to it too. It wasn't just like, I should appear on some podcasts. Like I wanted 10 podcast interviews, 10 influencers or collabs on TikTok? You know, I think you can get really caught up in like, oh, I need to be on 200 podcasts and I need 200 influencers. And then it becomes really overwhelming, like really overwhelming. And it's great to have your dream list of 100 um, podcasts and your dream list of 100 influencers and your dream list of 100 press, but set yourself something realistic because Mm -hmm. I gave myself a two month window to get everything ready. And I feel like that two months was a great amount of time because this is also like, in addition to everything else I have going on with the show and, you know, our like private community and like, you know, life. And that two months was a great window to get done what I needed to get done without it being like, you know, I never, I'm not someone who ever pulls an all nighter. I'm not someone who ever works like until three in the morning. Like that's (laughs) not my jam. I I need to be like organized and like, I, yes, I still do things last minute, but like, I'm not that kind of, you know, late night person. So I'm just bringing up this list. What else did I do here? Okay. So I reached out directly to some journalists in my network and I asked for like, friends to introduce me to people. I looked on LinkedIn. I did all that kind of thing. I did manage to get, um, actually I'll go into the results afterwards. Mm -hmm. Then I, what else did I do? I also asked a few people in my network just who had newsletters that weren't like business newsletters, but just like they had their own brands or, you know, the company that like the company's the branded accounts of the companies and the guests who were featured in the book to put it in their kind of company Slack channel or their company newsletter, their company communities. Smart. And then I also asked all of my friends, I basically put a WhatsApp together of the closest people that I know that would still love me if I hassled them to the end of the earth. Yeah. And I asked all of those people to send it to at least five people in their network who would like the book and who would just be like, yep, I'll buy it because you asked me to. Mm-hmm. So That is kind of like what I did on other channels. Then on my own channels, I started posting one to three TikToks every single day. And that was a great kind of like, I did that probably for the last one to two months. And that also like resulted in a lot of growth on my account. I think we grew six or 7,000 followers on TikTok, which also then it came across to, you know, my personal um, Instagram and my branded Instagram. Mm -hmm. I spoke on any live channels and like opportunities that I could get on, like panels, um, IG lives, things like that. And I said yes to everything like that. Yes. Then I, what else did I do? I had a five-part mini series booked for this week, like of my actual own show. I 
talked about the book in every single episode, just even a small call to action of like my book's coming out next week or like my book's coming out next month or like this is the date, mark it in your diary. Whew, what else and you had a launch party. I had a launch party. I had a launch party last week in London. I have one next week in New York. Whew. And I would say, I think that's, I think that's kind of like the holistic kind of overview of what I did. Okay. So I have two questions. Uh, number one, did you create this launch plan yourself or did you like work with a marketing strategist on it? And number two, if you could only do one thing to launch the book, to do it all over again, what would you do? So I, I did the plan myself. Um, I have a background in marketing and like, you know, I speak to hundreds of women and people like you. So like, I have a good idea of like what needs to be done in marketing. And it's just like, literally the list of everyone tells you to do these things just do the things just do it exactly just do the things there's no magic like, formula <laughs> exactly there's nothing out of the norm that you don't already know it's just about like actually executing on those kinds of things and if I had to do everything all over again I would just post on TikTok because wow. I think for me the most kind of I already had an inbuilt community from the show and, you know, the fact that I've built my TikTok and my personal Instagram and a branded Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the most buzz came from within our community. And just in terms of like TikTok in general, I think if I had been posting, you know, potentially like eight times a day or something totally nuts, it could have been absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, but I would say, yeah, I, and I had a lot of people on TikTok being like, oh my God, found the book, bought the book, just ordered my copy. And even still, Amazing. like when we post a video, people are like, oh my God, just bought your book. And so that's probably what I'd lean into. And moving forward, now that the launch has actually happened, I'm going to go back to posting three times a day because in the last two weeks, I've only posted once a day. It's just been too busy, yep. but I'm going to go back to three. Wow. So TikTok it is. I love that. TikTok it is <laughs> for sure. And I'm sure we all wish we started a little earlier on TikTok, but you know, the time is now, I guess, for the, the listener. Time is now. <laughs> and also YouTube shorts. I think the time is yeah. now for YouTube shorts as well. I'm like trying yeah. to build out my flow to start including that in there too. And yeah. the time it's, you know, it's not too late. It's only kind of like, I think just released in the last kind of six to 12 months in the UK and everywhere else outside of America. So yeah. time is now. So you've put a lot of hard work into this book launch. And one thing that we often do inside of my private membership community, the visionary method is celebrate our wins. I'm curious, have you celebrated this epic win in your (laughs) life or did you just go on to the next task? And if so, how are you celebrating? So it's so funny because I really thought that to get a bestseller status, it was going to take me three months. And that was like kind of in my mind. We hit bestseller on day one in multiple categories <laughs> and like I was sitting there being like, well, I thought it would be harder than this. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and so every day we've still been like bestseller, bestseller and like women in business, e-commerce, small business books, like all these different things across Australia, the UK and the US. And so on Monday I was like, well, let's go out to dinner. Like I can you know chill so my best friend had just came back from a trip overseas so we went for dinner my husband and her and we just had such a nice night together and that was really a celebration we had champagne we had oysters we did all the things Mm -hmm. um but yeah I would say you know next morning I was back at it (laughs) (laughs) yeah I know typical entrepreneur right never shuts (laughs) off never yeah. properly like soaks in the wind and just does nothing for a couple days. Yeah. No, now I'm like, okay, what's next? <laughs> I was just going to say, like, are you starting to plan? Cause you mentioned something about having this be more of an anthology. I don't know if that's the right word, but like a series of books. And obviously you have so many more podcasts that you've recorded that could be distilled into volume two, volume three, Now that you've gone through the process, is that still on your mind or are you focusing on other projects for the remainder of the year? What's coming up? It's definitely going to be a series. We want to get to a point where we're doing two to four a year, but that will start from next year, I would say, because it took a really long time. And the whole point of the first one was to just really understand the blueprint, what was needed, what are the costs involved, um, what's the results. And I think we won't really know the true impact of the results for another three months. 
because our strategy was very much to kind of like build in an upsell from the book. So people who wanted to join our private community or people who wanted to come and find our digital resources, like we won't know the impact of that until I would say three months time. Um, and then we'll be able to do it much faster the next time around. Oh yeah. So the rest of the year is actually focused on our like current digital resources, like repackaging them, like figuring out like the direction that we want to go and like, now that we have a lot of, we first launched our private network last July. And so now coming up kind of like on six to eight months or whatever it's been, you know, we've got more insights and more learnings. And now we can kind of go back and really iterate on what the current offering is, figure out what we want to kind of evolve it into. Yeah. Really focus on that over the next couple of months so that the book also leads directly into that. Mm-hmm. And then once that is like all systems down, funnels in place, kind of good to go, we will start working on the next book. Wow. Unbelievable. And yeah, I'm really excited (laughs) to see the impact. Um, And you've mentioned this private community. Can you just quickly explain what is Hype Club and who is it perfect for? Yeah. So Hype Club is a private network or a private membership for women who are building e-commerce brands and actively building e-commerce brands at the moment. So It's people who are in the early stages of the journey, say in like year one, they are trying to still figure out like what they need to do, but they're also looking for community because they're feeling a bit lonely. You know, it's the solopreneur trying to figure things out themselves, but like not really sure and needing just like, you know, a pat on the back from someone who knows. And so at the moment, it's a monthly kind of subscription, but we're looking to evolve this into more of a one-time you know, yearly purchase where you get this epic resource that's like a checklist of hundreds of points of literally just like follow this checklist. I'm someone that really loves a checklist. I don't want to watch 50 hours of videos. I just want to know like, what do I need to do step by step? And I will do it. Yep. So it's basically that format. It's hundreds of steps of like, do this, do this, do this. And then also on the back of that access to the community and everything that we've built in there. Mm. So cool. I love the idea of the checklist. I've had a couple people say that to me. They're like, you have so many videos inside of the visionary method. Can you just distill it all into a checklist? I'm like, okay, I think this is the way like people, a lot of people want to learn. So making note of that. Um, Totally. Okay. So I think the last thing I want to cover off is where can people find the book? Um, What's the best way to support you and even just get into your world because you share a lot of content Um, as you've mentioned, and I think it's important for people to get to know you. And then if buying the book is the logical next step, also a very giftable book, right? Like if you know a woman in your life starting an e-com business, please buy her this book, show her that you are supporting her, that you are rooting her on. Um, So yeah, where are the best places to connect with you and to find the book? I mean, TikTok 100%. I feel like TikTok is so much fun. I'm having so much fun with it in these quick, short, digestible stories that are basically like the journey of XYZ founder straight from the podcast, but like in really quick, snappy content. For more of like, just if you want to chat on Instagram, I'm at Dune Rasheen, which is D-O-O-N-E-R-O-I-S-I-N. And that's on TikTok as well. Um to buy the book you go to femalestartupclub.com that's our website you can also just search your hype girl directly in amazon uh it'll come up wherever you're based and yeah basically tiktok find me on tiktok Mm -hmm. i will link all of those in the show notes thank you so much for coming on sharing the journey kind of opening up what it actually looks like to curate the content of a book and put it into action. And just hearing you talk about the process, I think it makes us all believe that it is possible. So if it's something that's on your mind, on your heart, you just need to take those next logical steps. And in 14 months, it could be a reality. So very awesome. I'd highly suggest people go back to our first episode, which I'll link in the show notes, if they want to hear your story of actually kind of where you came from and the jobs you worked to get to this point where you started Female Startup Club. So thank you so much, Dune, and we wish you all the best as you continue to launch the book. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you so much for having me. I always love chatting with you.